I would like to invite Dan. Dan, if you're there, if you can switch on your webcam and microphone. Hello. Hi, Dan. Oh, we can hear you, see you. Um, great to hear you loud and clear. So um, I just want to tell everyone, I mean, we're all extremely excited here at Macmillan because we have this wonderful new course book called Language Hub, and this is a general English course book for adults. And uh, especially exciting because this book, I don't know if you can see the name, uh, is authored by Dan. And uh, we couldn't think of anyone better to launch this year's webinar program. And so uh, we're really excited to have the new course out and to have Dan here as well. Um, Dan and I were chatting earlier, and I, um, we're, we seem to be uh, both as old as each other as we <laughs> did our teacher training at the same time and have been in uh, English language teaching for the same length of time. Um, but uh, I only ever really worked in, in Italy. Uh, Dan has traveled much further than that. So Dan has taught in, in Europe, in Asia, and Australia, and not just taught. He's been director of studies, academic manager, examiner as well. And of course, a brilliant teacher, trainer, and author. And Dan is joining us today to tell us all about how to personalize our lessons with adult learners. So Dan, a warm welcome, and over to you. Thank you, Mike. What an introduction. Fantastic. Um, yes, I dare say we're as young as each other. Let's, let's hope so anyway. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of Macmillan. Um, and uh, you've joined us for the session, which is called Personalizing Adult Language Learning. Um, and we're going to be looking at a menu for the session uh, very soon. But I thought I would just add to uh, what Mike has said and introduce myself with a few uh, details. Um, 18 years, it turns out, I've been in the language teaching business. I was astonished when I worked this out uh, recently. And I've done all sorts during that time, as you heard. I still remember uh, my very first lesson. Uh, it was in Thailand at the weekend teaching, um, teaching young learners. And um, although in the end it was a positive experience, I was terrified at the time. Since then, I think I've taught just about all levels and all ages. And as you heard, worked in uh, language school management, some work with uh, examining and exams, lots of teacher training. And these days, um, I'm uh, an author. So it's been a busy 18 years, but there has been time for uh, my hobbies and interests. And I suppose that they are similar to some of your hobbies and interests. Um, reading is, is one, as you can probably tell from the bookshelf behind me. I'm an avid reader, always got a book uh, on the go. I'm also um, a great music fan a lover of music and occasional DJ. Um, usually just in the bedroom with the dog listening, but, but once, one glorious night, I did DJ in a nightclub, a night uh, that I will never forget. That was lots of fun. Uh, I like to cook, uh, particularly Asian food. And my love of Asian food comes from the time I spent in Thailand. Um, and um, another passion of mine I'm very pleased to say the opportunity to follow this passion is, is coming very soon because I'm a, I'm a very keen snowboarder. So perhaps unlike most of you, I'm really looking forward to uh, the arrival of winter. One more passion that uh, rather than explaining too much, I, I'd like to show you um, a photograph that illustrates that passion. Here we go. <laughs> uh, yes, this was taken on my honeymoon in Indonesia not with the monkey. I should point out that I do have a, a human wife. Um, uh, but my, my other passion is nature. I'm a, I'm a lover of all things to do with the natural world. I think David Attenborough should be made prime minister and king. Um, and my love of nature has in no small part to do with this uh, young man. Um, where has he gone? There he is. This is Flash, uh, our dog, who is actually around somewhere here today. But we we made a pact that he would stay quiet if I showed his photograph. So, so there he is, that's, um, that's Flash. Hopefully he'll stick to his side of the bargain. And Flash, of course, is an important time, uh, an important part of the writing 
team in charge of making sure I take uh, regular breaks from the desk for walks. So there we go, you know a little bit more about me now. Let's have a look at the menu for the session today. Once again, just to remind you, we're talking about personalizing adult language learning. And I want to start with um, a definition. It's always a good place to start. And a short discussion of the origins of, of personalization as a classroom technique um, and as a principle of humanistic teaching methodology. We'll then go on to have a look at how we can personalize input um, through materials design, through carefully selecting topics. And I also want to mention how we can make even controlled practice uh, so language input followed by control practice, how that can be made student-centered and personalized. Once we've talked about input, we'll then go on to talk about output, so what the, the language that the students produce. Um, and I want to look particularly at some of the pitfalls of using um, freer personalized speaking activities in class um, and, of course, suggest some solutions to help us avoid those pitfalls. Uh, one of the challenges we have as teachers is providing our students with feedback um, on the language that they produce during uh, group speaking exercises and, and a technique that you may be familiar with, uh, one that I think is, is very useful uh, in such situations, is delayed error correction. So more about that towards the end of the webinar session. To help us along the way, we're going to be looking at uh, ideas and examples taken from Language Hub. As you heard from Mike, this is the latest general English course for adults from Macmillan. I'm very uh, proud to say that I co-authored it with my colleague John Hurd. Um, and it's designed to take the complexity out of teaching. Uh, and later in the session, I want to return to that idea um, and explain exactly what I mean by that. We also chose topics for Language Hub that lend themselves to personalization uh, because I feel it's one of the most important aspects of successful classroom practice. So again, more about that as we go on. I said we'd start with a, a definition, so let's do just that. Um, and we're going to turn to some famous names to help us define what we mean by personalization in the context of ELT. The first of those famous names, I'm sure you recognize, Scott Formbury, uh, on his excellent blog and book, um, An A to Z of ELT. Uh, he, he defines personalization by saying that when you personalize language, you use it to talk about your knowledge, experience, and feelings. A concise definition. Um, another source, the British Council website, Teaching English, another excellent place to go for advice and method, methodology for teachers, um, they say that personalization happens when activities allow students to use language to express their own ideas, feelings, preferences, and opinions. And finally, another well-known name, Jeremy Harmer, in his book Essential uh, Teacher Knowledge, says personalization is when students use language to talk about themselves and the things uh, which interest them. So, a definition, personalization in the ELT classroom. Now, a million points for anybody out there who knows uh, who this lady is. I was traveling recently in Germany, um, giving a version of this, a live version of this uh, session, and one lady called out from the audience, is it your mum? Uh, no, it's not my mum. This is actually a lady called Gertrude Moskowitz. You may or may not have heard of, of Gertrude Moskowitz. She wrote um, a wonderful book uh, as early as 1978, uh, and it's called Caring and Sharing in the Language Class. And Gertrude Moskowitz was one of the first proponents of a humanistic approach uh, to language teaching and learning, essentially putting the student at the center of uh, language learning. Now, um, this book is 40 years old, and as you can tell from the title and the cover, it is rather touchy-feely in places. However, Moskowitz um, sets out some key principles which I think are just as relevant today as they, as they were 40 years ago when they were first um, proposed. And I just want to look at three of those. 
Um, I'm going to ask you to sort of help me. I know you can't call out, but as we look at these principles, I've actually blanked out some of the words. So you'll see on the next slide that a couple of words are missing. That's essentially just to help keep you awake. Um, so have a look as we're speaking through and see if you can be thinking what the blanked out words might be. Here, here's the first one. So a principle suggested by Moskowitz that was that we should connect the content with the students something. It's lives. By connecting the students' uh, lives, you're focusing in what the students know rather than what they are ignorant of. And from the learner's standpoint, uh, there's quite a psychological difference in dealing with what is familiar rather than what is unknown. In a nutshell, uh, Moskowitz, I believe, was saying that personalization builds confidence. It's human nature to, to want to talk about yourself, uh, and it's a topic that we are all very familiar with. So a great one on which to draw in the language classroom. The second principle, which I think is very relevant to uh, our teaching today, is this, uh, that we should use the students something in the lesson. And that something is responses. The students will be sharing of themselves. So we perhaps should utilize what they share by asking the class questions uh, relating to what has been exchanged in the interaction. In simpler terms, I interpret this as Moskowitz reminding us that personalization requires feedback. Uh, it requires feedback on the content of what was said, as well as the quality of the language that was used to do so. And that's something I'll come back to several times today, because it's, it's easy to forget, isn't it, that we should uh, react to what our students have said before we begin to deal with the way in which they've said it, by which I mean correcting any language mistakes they've made. The third principle uh, that Moskowitz suggested was that, well, again, to remind us that our students have ideas too. She said we shouldn't overlook an important resource of ideas for humanistic techniques. Who can tell you what interests them better than, well, the students themselves? Um, absolutely. So if we're, if we're looking for a motto for today's session, and I kind of like to think of it as a motto for my own teaching and my own uh, writing, then, um, then it's this. That is bringing the students' lives to the content brings the content to life. Uh, neatly put by Moskowitz. Good. So a definition and a slight exploration of the origins um, of, of uh, personalization in the classroom. So we're going to move on and talk about personalizing language input now. Um, and um, as I probably mentioned, I've been traveling. I'm not actually writing uh, at the moment, so I've had a little bit more time for teacher training. And I've been traveling recently, most recently to Germany, uh, to deliver this very session, in fact, but live. Um, and uh, I went to Munich. Um, did I tell you I'm based in Poland? P perhaps I didn't. Um, I'm based in the south of Poland, so it's it's quite a journey from here to Munich. And um, I noticed during that journey that uh, only two people used a pen to write. Only two people. One of them was me, uh, and that was me making notes as I always do on my on the, on the slides, you know, to try and help me remember what to say during the session. Uh, the other person I saw using a pen was a student, um, clearly a medical student, because he was drawing um, a diagram of a human heart, interestingly, uh, which got me to thinking that I wonder if these days the only people who actually use a pen to write anymore are teachers and students. Teachers, of course, um, tell me that many of them still write their uh, lesson plans uh, by hand. I know I always have done. Um, and, of course, we write on the whiteboard, don't we? Uh, students tend to take notes during lectures uh, by hand still. And, and all of us uh, write certain things by hand. Um, shopping lists, perhaps. Uh, you know, notes when, when you take a note, take a message for someone on the phone. Um, and, of course, our signatures, for the most part, are still written by hand. Uh, here's mine. Now, I know you know what my name is, so uh, if I ask you whether my signature is legible, I'm, I'm probably cheating a little bit. 
the sentence that I've written underneath my signature there uh, is, is special. You may have seen it before. It's special because it contains all the letters of the alphabet, A through to Z, uh, and it's called a pangram. So all the letters of the alphabet uh, are there. Now, I'm kind of interested in, in handwriting uh, and graphology. Uh, graphology is the study of handwriting, and uh, graphologists very often work in legal circles, um, identifying, you know, matching people to their handwriting, identifying whether a signature is um, real or, or fake. Um, and some graphologists, perhaps we could call them pop graphologists, also think that our handwriting tells us quite a lot about our personality. So by looking at things like uh, the size and shape of our letters, um, they believe we can learn something about uh, the way we actually are. Now, you can't really tell because it's here on your screen, but I can tell you that after analysing my own handwriting, um, I think my letters are medium-sized. Uh, and according to, according to graphology, medium-sized letters suggest that I am a sensible person. Um, I'm not sure my wife would agree, um, but she's not here, so we won't ask her. Um, so by looking at different aspects of our, our handwriting, we can perhaps tell something about a personality. And it struck me that this might be a, a nice context for uh, a lesson on personality, a very easy context in which to personalize um, input. It's a lesson that I put into uh, the B1 level of Language Hub, and it begins with an opportunity for the students to discuss their own writing habits. Do they write more often by hand or do they type? Which do they find easier and what sort of things do they write by hand? And after that initial discussion to raise interest, we then go on to look at a, a text and it's a text in the form of an infographic. As you can see, this infographic is, is all about graphology and, and gives us information about exactly what the spacing between words means or the legible or not of your signature. And this text comes from a lesson that I just want to show you briefly, um, as I said, in the B1 level of Language Hub. It's a full spread for one lesson, as all the lessons in Language Hub are. Uh, and after that initial discussion that we saw and a, a reading task, um, we're using the language from the text to work on uh, grammar, first of all, and vocabulary. And you'll find that all the main spreads in Language Hub follow this similar pattern. Some input and then work on both grammar and vocabulary there on the page. So it's a topic that's very easy to personalize. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to a practice exercise. Uh, you can see it's circled here at the bottom. Um, this is a practice exercise for prepositions, um, at, for, with, etc. Um, and I gave this quite a lot of thought when I was producing these materials. How can we make uh, control practice exercises more interesting than just, you know, a simple gap filter? You know, Jenny is good gap baking. The students write in at, well, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. So I thought about this and decided that perhaps we could turn this around and, and uh, put the students at the center of it by using personalized questions and statements um, as, the, as the gap fills. So as you'll see here, rather than Jenny is good at baking, what are you good at? And there are six questions here that practice the prepositions from the text. And um, as you could probably expect, what we then go on and do is ask the students to work in pairs and discuss those questions. So uh, we're bringing the students' lives to the content. Remember what Moskowitz said personalized topic and personalized uh, controlled practice. The lesson continues um, with some input on pronunciation. There's a very strong pronunciation syllabus throughout Language Hub. Uh, and then we come to the final task, uh, the final speaking task. Let me make that just a little bit larger. The idea is that the students using the information uh, in the infographic about handwriting uh, they, they sign their names, they write out the pangram, and then they, they swap papers, they look at each other's handwriting and uh, interpret it, and then discuss what it says about their personalities. So, um, uh, you know, a, a very easy topic to personalize and hopefully breathe some, some life into. 
Um, now, before we move away from talking about the book, I promise I won't do that for the entire session, but I did mention earlier on that um, we designed Language Hub to try to take the complexity out of teaching. And that's more than just a, a marketing line. Let me explain to you what exactly I mean by that. With the help of the teacher's book, which I have a, a copy of here, which I'll just show you. Um, these are simple things, but we hope they'll make your lives a little bit easier. Um, for example, the teacher's book, as you can see, is ring bound. Now, I think the photocopying is stressful enough without having to worry about ruining your book by, by bending back the spine. So, of course, a ring bound book is very easy to open up. And at the back of the book, you'll find um, a treasure trove, a wealth of extra photocopyable activities to provide further practice of uh, the language in the book and to provide further opportunities for communication. And the same is true of the student's book as well, because we all know you can never get enough practice of vocabulary and grammar. Something else to point out is that the student book pages are interleaved with the teacher's book page. And again, if I can just show you, this is the, the lesson that we were looking at uh, with the infographic. Nope, I'm backwards, aren't I? So this side is exactly what the students see uh, in their book. This side here, that way, is the accompanying teacher's notes. So you don't need two books. Um, everything's there together. And in the same way, we decided to annotate the answer key on the student's book pages there within the, the teacher's book. Obviously, the answers are not in the student's book, but they're there on the page in the teacher's book to, again, avoid you having to flick backwards and forwards. Similarly, uh, you'll find methodology guidance from uh, no other than Jim Scrivener from his excellent book, Learning Teaching, the third edition of that. Uh, again, right there on the teacher's book page, right next to the lesson to which it applies. And the same thing is true for extra teaching ideas uh, taken from Macmillan's books for teachers. You'll find them right there on the page, just where you need them. So really, the only thing you need to prepare and teach your lessons is, is this one teacher's book. Good, let's move on. We've talked about personalizing language input. Let's talk about personalizing language output. Uh, I need a sip of water, excuse me for a second. I don't know if I said earlier on um, that I am English. You can probably tell from my accent anyway. So, because I'm English, you know what I do at 5 p.m. every day, I think. Tea with the Queen, of course, as we all do in England. Um, or in my case, it's coffee, um, because very unusually for an Englishman, I don't like tea with milk. Um, I take my coffee as black as a moonless night. Um, probably used to drink too much coffee. I've tried to, to cut down these days. I'm down to just one cup a day. There it is. Um, I recently read, actually, that you can drink up to 25 cups of coffee a day without it affecting your heart health. But can you imagine uh, 25 cups of coffee a day? I would, I would never sleep. Now, this topic brings to mind one of my all-time favorites, uh, a very simple classroom activities, which allows for personalized student output. Unfortunately, because we're, we're in a webinar today, um, I can't ask you to try it out and talk to each other. However, I do want to explain it you and it's called tea or coffee. Now imagine that the slide that you're seeing now is your is your whiteboard um, and all you have to do is is write up some choices for the students. In this case tea or coffee, spicy food or mild food, uh, a wild night out or a quiet night in, etc. Um, and the idea is that the students discuss whether they are tea people or coffee people, whether they prefer spicy food or mild food and it takes them a few minutes to work through this uh, and then we have some feedback now this is a very flexible activity which is one reason why i like it it's materials free and it can be altered to suit really whatever topic you're teaching at the moment so for example if if you're teaching sports uh, you could have the options as um, uh, play sport or watch sport indoor sports or outdoor sports, etc. If it's Christmas time, you can even change it to, you know, giving presents, receiving presents, uh, turkey, or
or as people prefer here in Poland, carp and fish um, at Christmas. So a very flexible activity. And in fact, one that demonstrates some of the very basic principles of successful personalized speaking activities. Uh, and these are some of those principles. First of all, if an activity is going to be successful, it needs, of course, to be motivating. Um, and generally, there are two types of motivation in the language classroom. <coughs> Excuse me. The first of these is what's called mechanical motivation. Um, and that refers to activities where there's some sort of puzzle to solve, some sort of task to be completed, uh, and the students gain satisfaction from solving that puzzle. The second type of motivation is through talking about ourselves, through personalization. And very often, activities that we use in class are a combination of the two. Uh, setup is all important, um, and this is our job as teachers, of course. Um, this is perhaps when we work the hardest in setting up the activity because we need to give very clear instructions um, and usually the best way to do that is with, uh, with a demonstration. Now, a few minutes ago you may have wondered why is Dan telling us about his tea and coffee drinking habits? Well, if I was doing this activity in class I would have done the same thing uh, and the reason is that I wanted to give you an indication of how long um, or rather give the students an indication of how long I expected them to speak for, roughly, and the sort of language I hoped they would use during the activity. And what better way to do that than a quick demonstration? If we're going to ask the students to give of themselves, then I think we need to be willing to, to share some information about ourselves with them. Um, it's a confidence builder to do so. So give instructions with a demonstration and, of course, check those instructions. Task preparation is the next point on the screen in front of you. And task preparation refers to planning time for the students. Time for them to think about what they want to say and how they're going to say it. And um, the lower the level, the more time they will probably need to, to think uh, of what they're going to say. So if we don't allow for that time, I think we could be setting ourselves up to fail. And uh, finally, closure, a point that I, I made earlier on that I, I will return to. Um, we need to provide feedback, not only on uh, what the students say, but also on the language they've used. And it's, it's actually uh, very easy to forget that we should feedback on content uh, before we feedback on language. Imagine a situation where your student very excitedly tells you, oh, last week I go to Paris. Um, and you know, being a, a good teacher, you jump straight in and say, ah, I go to Paris, um, past simple, irregular verb, not I go to Paris, but I, by which time they've probably lost interest in telling you the story of what they were doing in Paris. So I prefer to feedback on contact, uh, content first. Tell me, please tell me all about Paris. What did you do? And then we'll come back to the language later. Um, and uh, I want to share with you a technique to allow this to happen in the classroom that works very well with large groups. We'll come back to that. So, uh, some basic rules for success, if you like, with personalized language output. I've skipped ahead just a moment. Um, we all know, I think, what it's like uh, to plan um, an output session, to plan a personalized language output activity, uh, to set it up, to check our instructions, and to be greeted by silence the students. Similarly, we've probably all experienced our lovely 15-minute speaking activity uh, coming rapidly to a close after about a minute. I'm very interested in what's going on in the students' heads when things don't work out. Um, when students are not speaking as we hoped they would, why is that happening? And I, I gave this some thought and came up with a, a list of possible reasons, um, some pitfalls. Now, the first of these is that there may be uh, gaps in the student's linguistic knowledge. I, I, I want to run through this list and then we'll come back to each of them individually. So they may not have the language they need for the task we've set. It may be that they don't understand the task. They don't know what we've asked them to do, or perhaps they just lack the confidence to speak out loud. Perhaps they haven't had that planning time that I just mentioned um, and haven't had chance to think about what they're going to say or how they're going to say it. Well, they may simply have no ideas um, to offer on the topic that we've chosen. 
this might sound a little bit harsh, but sometimes they may have no reason to listen to their partners. Uh, after a long week in an eight o'clock Friday evening lesson, um, they may be feeling a little bit tired and perhaps not so keen on listening carefully to what their partners have to say. Um, and perhaps the more switched on of our students, those that are more aware of uh, or more experienced, let's say, might even have doubts about the value of these sort of personalized freer speaking activities. So what can we do to avoid these pitfalls? Let's run through them uh, one by one. So the first is gaps in their linguistic knowledge. In Language Hub, John and I have done what we can uh, to feed in the language necessary for the speaking tasks in the book. And you'll find that the, the lengthy speaking communicative tasks always come at the end of uh, those one spread lessons. Uh, we thought very carefully about the language that will be needed and tried to introduce this during the lesson itself. So we hope um, through materials design, we've um, minimized the chance that students will not have the language they need for the task. The next pitfall was that the students simply haven't understood the task. And this probably uh, rests on our shoulders. Uh, to emphasize again what I said just a moment ago, it's very important that we, we uh, set up tasks with clear instructions. Um, I think the best way to do that is to model the task. It gives an indication of how long students should speak, what kind of language they should use, and shows that we're also willing as teachers to share some personal information with them. And of course, it's very important to check those instructions before um, the task begins. What else can go wrong? Perhaps the students are lacking in confidence. Um, it may be difficult for us to do something about this uh, in some cases because it may just be um, a facet of someone's personality. However, I think one thing that we need to get across to our students is that there are times in the lesson when we're very interested in accuracy, but there are also times in the lesson when fluency is the goal. If you like, it's sort of a scale, isn't it? So there's accuracy here and then there's fluency later. And I think it's important to tell the students that during these speaking activities, what we want them to focus on is fluency. So use whatever language you have to try to communicate. And this perhaps will help some of them to feel a little more confident. By choosing personalized activities, I think we've already set off on the right foot because as we've said previously, it's, it's easier to talk about yourself and your own feelings um, than, than anything else really. Um, let's take three of them together now, three more pitfalls. Sometimes students don't have any content ideas that, you know, they, they, they're just left with a blank face. They don't have anything to say. Um, if you've ever taught teenagers, this can be particularly true uh, of them. Um, students may not be speaking because they haven't had a chance to plan what they're going to say. Um, and as we mentioned before, they may not just not have a reason to listen to their partners and their attention has therefore uh, drifted off. Now, I had these in mind when I was putting together the materials for Language Hub and, and I think that all of these problems can be uh, avoided through careful materials design. And let me show you exactly what I mean by that. Um, here's another lesson from Language Hub. This one's called Time Flies and it's a, a lesson about important life events. After all the input, uh, there's the final speaking task, which I'll just make a little bit bigger there. Don't worry about reading right through it, but I do want to point out um, a few things about this task. The idea is that the students talk about their first time experiences here. Um, and we said that one problem they have is that they may not have any ideas. They may not know what to say. So in section A, I've provided them with some ideas. There is, of course, the flexibility for them to use their own ideas if they have them. But if not, here's some to get you get you going, if you like. The second pitfall that we mentioned just uh, previously was that they haven't had time to plan what they're going to say. So I thought it would be a good idea to build this into the task. Um, so in section B here, we give them some prompts, some questions to think about. Um, and a, a short time to make some notes um, to prepare uh, to speak, to prepare for success, in fact. Um, and finally, we said that students' attention may wonder. They may not have a re reason to listen to their partners in pair or group 
speaking activities. So um, again, we can build something in to help here. In this case, uh, the students are asked to talk about first time experiences, two true ones and one false one. And the task for listeners down here in section C is as they're listening to their partners to try to identify um, the term that is about the false experience. So actually a little bit of that mechanical motivation here at the end, a puzzle to solve that we hope will keep listeners focused as well. So solving those pitfalls through out of materials design. There was just one more, um, and that was doubts about the value of personalized career speaking, particularly amongst uh, higher level students, particularly amongst more experienced students, and those that are more switched on to things like learner training. Um, what kind of doubts? Well, these kind of doubts. Um, there's no point in talking about ourselves if we use bad English to do it. Okay. Uh, you should be teaching us, not just letting us talk to each other. That's lazy teaching. A little bit harsh, perhaps, but okay. I speak a lot, but what's the point? If you never correct me, I'll never improve. Now, the first two of these doubts, I think, I think we've already talked about the solution to these. I think we can allay those doubts by pointing out to students that um, these freer personalized fluency activities are a time for, well, just that, for fluency and not accuracy. The idea is to work on fluency and use the linguistic resources they have to communicate. So I think it's just a matter of pointing that out to students. Returning to the third doubt there, I speak a lot, but what's the point if you never correct me? Well, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And the challenge is for us as teachers to, yes, feedback on the content of what our students have said, but also feedback on the language that we've heard during the speaking activity. Um, and that could be very difficult to do in a class of, let's say, 20 students working in pairs. You've got 10 pairs of students all having different conversations. How do you gather examples of, of good and faulty language for feedback? Well, this is where you need uh, a couple of things. First of all, um, a well set out room. Um, and secondly, teaching superpowers. Let me explain a little bit more what I mean there. Um, I think a mistake that many of us make during speaking activities uh, is to um, loom over the students. So you've set things up, they've begun speaking and then we're over there, we're right next to them and we're watching exactly what it is that they're doing, trying to gather language. And you perhaps found the same as me that when we do this, invariably students stop talking. They may think that we want to contribute something. They may see it as an opportunity to ask a question. Um, the middle of a fluency activity is not the time to ask a question. So uh, avoid looming. And for the same reason, avoid making eye contact with the students. And this is where classroom setup is quite important. If you have the students sat in a horseshoe, for example, uh, or, or in, in rows or at tables, um, it's usually possible to get behind the students um, and therefore we can hear what they're saying without actually sort of making visual contact with them uh, and interrupting what they're saying. Um, so the layout of the classroom is very important. Um, now it still can be very challenging, particularly with noisy groups, to hear language and what I always try to do in these situations is gather three examples of great, great things that I heard. Um, so three examples of where the students have used the language that we've presented in the lesson um, and even developed it. And three examples of faulty language that we want to, to try to correct. Um, and I'll confess to you, there have been times where I haven't been able to hear my three and my three. So I've made a few of them up. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We as teachers know the kind of mistakes that students are going to make with the language that we're presenting uh, to them. So I, I really don't think there's anything wrong with making up a couple of examples of either good or faulty language. What do we do with that language once we've gathered it? Well, um, during the last minute or so of the, the student's uh, activity, uh, we need to get it up on the whiteboard. What we're talking about here is a technique called delayed error correction, by the way collected the language, we've put it up onto the whiteboard 
anonymously, of course, we don't want to uh, single students out for mistakes they may have made with language. Um, and remembering to feedback on the content of what was said first, we can then hand over to students to look at that language that we've put on the board. I usually do it in, in pairs um, and I ask them to, to look at the board uh, and spot three great things that I heard while I was walking around and three um, errors or mistakes that we are going to work on correcting. And of course, ask the students to suggest corrections for, for the faulty language. So again, we're putting them at the center of the action, if you like. Um, that's delayed error correction. And we can even reinforce that by starting the, the next lesson uh, with some sort of uh, revision worksheet, picking up again on the errors that we heard in the previous lesson. Um, to do that, the best way, I think, is just to, excuse me, is to take a photograph of the board with your, with your mobile phone um, and then you can, you can look later and, and remind yourself of, of the language that went up there. And if you've got time, you could even invent a text, um, a story or a paragraph that contains some of those errors and ask the students at the beginning of the next lesson to, to correct it again. So that's a technique known as delayed error correction and it's very useful for uh, providing feedback um, on language, which in turn helps students to see the value of these uh, fluency activities um, that we use at the end of lessons. Okay, great. Um, I hope you're still with us. There's just time for a quick roundup of, of what we've said. Um, we began, if you remember, with a definition um, of personalization, and we saw that it comes out of a humanistic approach to language uh, advocated by, uh, amongst others, Gertrude Moskowitz as far back as 1978. Uh, we looked at personalizing student input and saw that by careful topic choice um, we can personalize and also we can even make uh, control practice personalized um, by using personal questions and statements there. Then we looked at personalizing output uh, and some of the pitfalls, some of the reasons that students may not be speaking as we hoped they would. And I hope I've uh, suggested solutions to all of those pitfalls. Um, one of the most important solutions is the technique called delayed error correction, which is allow as allows us to feedback on, on language after group speaking activities. Um, so there we are. I really hope that the session has been of use to you today. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, for me to deliver it. And I think we'll, we'll bring Mike back in now and um, we will, amongst other things, try to answer some of the uh, questions that you've been posting during the session. Mike, are you there? I am. Can you hear me, Dan? Yes, I can. Yes. Hi. Okay. Dan, um, firstly, before we get to the question, uh, uh, a huge thank you from everybody here at Momentum Education, all of the teachers who've joined us online. I think it was a, a, a brilliant session, lots of pressure on you as you're the first speaker in our in our series, but I thought it was a fantastic session. And, and I, I, did, I realized in the session we've got something in common, because I am also an Englishman who doesn't really drink tea. And I'm ah. not, but um, I want to show the world what I drink my... <clears throat> So I have a special <laughs> language hub mug. So there you are. This is this has got some hot coffee in there. So Mike, the similarities continue because I've got two of those in my cupboard. Okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. so we're going to make everyone jealous. So let's, uh, let's <laughs> move on. So um, and I also want to say a very quick thank you to uh, particularly to Piotr and Federica who um, work here at Macmillan behind the scenes. And Federica has just joined uh, the team and, and, and done an amazing job getting today's webinar ready. She's sitting next to me, but she's too shy to come on <laughs> camera, so. Uh, me too, thank you guys, thank you. Yeah. And um, just a reminder to everybody that you'll get your certificate for attending. And I was checking, and you were all concentrating, so you all deserve your, your certificate. Um, that will be sent directly to your inbox um, in the next two days. 
So we've got your email addresses, so you don't need to do anything. Uh, don't worry, you'll get that um, delivered um, to you. Obviously, you're all interested in Language Hub and where it's available. Um, please check the, um, the Language Hub website. Uh, you can also contact um, the Macmillan office in your local area, and they can tell you all about um, the availability of Language Hub, depending where you are um, in the world. We also have a uh, blog that links to the webinar series. Um, the Advancing Learning blog is um, on One Stop English. So you've got the link on the screen right now. So if you want to follow uh, that, you can do lots of great tips and advice on there. And it's completely free. So that's onestopenglish.com uh, is the website to go to. And uh, if you want to, uh, register for the next webinars. You just need to follow the link that is up there again. I, I think you all know it because you've all registered for this one. It's the same link. Um, it's MacmillanEnglish.com forward slash webinars. And we have a very special treat for you. On the 2nd of October, uh, we have a Teachers Day conference, which starts at 12 o'clock UK time. And not just bringing you one webinar, but six. We've got Carol Reed, Emma Reynolds, Amy Blanchard, Chia Suen Chong, Joe Ramsden, and Russell Stannard um, to give you a great selection of ideas and, and uh, activities to take into your classroom. So um, please uh, go to the website and sign up there. But um, Dan has very kindly agreed to answer any of your questions. So if you have a question for Dan, Please type it in the chat box now. So, um, question about giving feedback on content. Um, so, I suppose. Um, Maybe not so much giving on the pronunciation or the grammar, but on the actual content of what the students are producing. Um, Mike, I can't actually see the questions at the moment that are being that have been typed in, unfortunately. But um, yeah. can you tell me anything more about the the nature of that question? So I think um, we spoke. You, know, you spoke in your session about the importance of giving feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, um, concentrating on the linguistic aspects of. You know, grammar, pronunciation, vocab. But have you any advice on actually how to comment on the content of what they're discussing rather um, than the language? Sure, sure. I mean, I think um, it's, it's hard to overstate the importance of doing this, I think, um, in terms of uh, rapport, the rapport that's built uh, between the teachers and the students. It's um, as in life, really, you know, if someone if someone shares something interesting uh, with you, then it is um, only correct to um, you know to show some interest in that your, yourself. And um, I think you know, in terms of tips for doing that, I would I would say the best thing you can try to do is just to be yourself in class and try to react in a, a way that you would if a friend told you you know something interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have to be careful in in, um, in the questions that we we ask students during that process, not to take things too uh, personal and and not ever to sort of embarrass the student in any way, um, but to to you know show interest and to some extent to to joke around a little bit with our students. I think can only help um, the rapport between yourself and your students. So it's very important to do so. And really do so by being yourself. Great. Um, we've had a couple of questions as well about what about the introverted students, the quiet students who are maybe reluctant to speak. Any tips there for how to get the students to speak? Yes, I mean this is first of all a matter of knowing your students, isn't it, and knowing who the quiet ones are. Um, I think um, preparation time can can help 
here to some extent, um, something that we mentioned during the session. Um, another pitfall that we didn't mention, of course, is sort of trying to force your students to speak out when they're, when they're perhaps not willing to. I think that, that sometimes we have to concede that there are going to be quieter students and noisier students. And sometimes it's, it's as much as a problem trying to get the noisy ones to shut up for a bit as it is to get the quiet ones to, to speak up. One thing you can think about is pairing students. Um, and you'll have to experiment this with, with this yourself, whether it, it works better to pair two of the quieter students together um, or whether it works better to, to pair a quieter student with a louder a student, a more outgoing student. Um, I would say a little bit of experimentation there and, and not to push students to the point at which they are uncomfortable. Okay. Um, another interesting question we've had is when the students are speaking in pairs, how do you encourage the person who isn't speaking to actively listen to the other person. Mm -hmm. Yes, as we mentioned during the session, um, uh, providing some sort of task for the listeners is uh, is one way to, to tackle this. Um, it may be uh, something that we looked at, so it's identifying one thing that, you, that the student um, that you're listening to uh, has said that is false. So it may be within the design of the materials, but simpler tasks that you can give to listeners are um, to listen to what your partner is saying and uh, be thinking about a question that they can ask about what they heard um, at the end of, of the partner's turn. The task could even be as simple as uh, listen and react. So, you know, I want you to be as you're listening, I want you to be nodding and saying, mm hmm, uh, in the correct places. So even so, a simple task such as that can encourage uh, students to listen to each other. Okay. Uh, Dan, you've already got people asking if you'll do the next webinar as well. So <laughs> it would be my pleasure. Good job today. So Thank you. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, what one person did mention, what, what do we do if, when we're personalizing the lesson if the students start to share too much or things that are inappropriate? For them? Yes, um, in such situations, then the teacher really needs to take control uh, to avoid things um, becoming embarrassing for everyone in the class. Now, you know your students whether, whether the right look from you will um, indicate to a student that they should perhaps to change direction in what they're saying or whether you actually need to um, ask the student to um, well, you can't ask them to be quiet can you but what you can do is, is some, you know something along the lines of okay thank you let's hear from someone else very quickly before things uh, go where they shouldn't so teacher awareness um, and if necessary uh, showing that you're the boss okay that's great. So I, I think that you, this is the second time you've done the webinar today. Um, you've done a brilliant job. And uh, I think um, it's probably getting late there in Poland. So I think it's fair to let you clock off for the day. So thank you. Um, thank you. I think you will join me, I'm sure, in thanking all of the teachers who have joined us today. I mean, it's, it's amazing that we've got hundreds of people online from, as we saw at the beginning, from every corner of the globe and, and we know that um, your teachers and are incredibly busy so we really appreciate uh, you spending the time uh, with us an hour is a long time to to spend when you're a teacher so um thank you so much for for joining us and then dan uh, on behalf of everyone a huge thank you to you and a, a fantastic session uh and i'm sure that uh, people online will be watching the recording again when it's uploaded next week and telling their colleagues um, all about it. So um, uh, I do hope so. Thank you very much, Mike. And, and thank you very much, everybody. Um, so that's me signing off. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Thank you very much. And then just to remind everyone, um, Language Hub is Dan's uh, book. And it's a general English course, six levels. 
and it's designed for adult students. So you can find out more about that online or speak to your local uh, Macmillan office. Do join us on the 2nd of October. And don't forget, you will get your certificate sent through to your email. Uh, that will come in the next uh, two days, so you don't need to do anything. And um, thank you all very much um, for joining us. And um, I'll say good night to you, to those of you about to go to bed, and good luck to, to those of you about to start your day at work. So. Um, look forward to seeing you uh, at the next event.